It's great to see you all for this uh, fabulous evening of jewelry making and mystical exploration. Um, this is called Gemstones and Kabbalah. One of my thoughts in, in kind of creating this event with Donna was how can we do an event that's online, but also has some sort of interactive feel to it, some sort of tactile, you know, fun, exciting, engaging activity. And what better, to, what better thing to do on a Monday night than create jewelry and have a discussion about some, some deeper topics. So Donna, I wanna welcome you. And uh, so, oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Rabbi Ari Solish. Um, I am the director of the Intown Jewish Academy. Uh, we do a lot of programs, educational programs, and this is one of them, and it's great to see you all. Donna, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Ari. It's great to be here, because this afternoon at noon, I was on, I wasn't a co-host with the rabbi. I was taking his daily power parsha at noon, and we celebrated, the group celebrated our 100th session. So that was exciting. So there were some good things to come out of this pandemic. <laughs> and um, so the whole concept for the piece of jewelry I'll be uh, leading you through today, and the whole session actually came from inspiration that I got from one of Rabbi Ari's uh, daily power Parsha sessions. He was uh, talking about the Tukil, Tukil, help me with that pronunciation, Rabbi. It's uh, Tehillet. Tehillet, yes, okay. So he was, uh, he was instructing us on the beautiful story of the Tehillet. Can you share the story please, Rabbi? Um, sure. Well, there's, I, I, there's a few different ones, but essentially in the Torah, the Torah says that when uh, we create the fringes called the tzitzit on the corner of the garments, that it should have a, uh, like a, a blue thread mixed in. It should be techelet, which was created in a very unique way from a very unique creature, which we don't really know what produced that dye exactly today. There's some theories, but we don't know exactly. It, it's, it's very interesting. So um, and so the inspiration for this necklace that I'm leading, we'll be working with you together to create ourselves came from that because that really touched me, that story of the one little blue thread, how that could be so inspirational. So what I did was I came up with a design uh, based off of one of my signature pieces in my gemstone jewelry company that I founded a few years ago here in Atlanta. And I'm also a yoga instructor. So we use malas, they're called in yoga. They're 108 beads and helps with uh, meditation and things like that. So I wanted to use that concept, but of course have the Jewish inspiration and Kabbalah theme. So working together with the rabbi, we came up with the tree of life and Sephirot energies. And uh, so we're gonna be working through three, three different color themes and their energies. And there's actually a different shade of the blue th blue thread for each of the three color combinations. So that's very interesting as well. Okay, so I hope uh, everybody has their PDF. So this is the necklace that I'm wearing and I named it Hatikva, white jade necklace. Of course, we all know what Hatikva stands for, the, you know, the national anthem of the state of Israel. And I have uh, a little excerpt from that to give us inspiration. So the core, from the design point of view, the core of the necklace are 108 gemstone white jade beads. And in gemstone jewelry, each type of, of gemstone has its own energy as well, in addition to the sephiroth color energies. So white jade, as you can see uh, on the handout, it gives hope and inspiration and positivity and all things like that. So I thought, that was perfect no, moved the computer. for a whole hot ticket <laughs> and all the positivity that we learn every day about me, um, and also from a design point of view, me, the perfect backdrop to have the hint of color of the three different colors of the different Sephiroth energies that we'll see. There's going to be, each of you have a different color theme that you chose uh, from Oceanside to Twilight to Sun to Sunset and sunrise and we'll see what they all mean more in depth okay as we go on so shall we get started okay so the first thing so i also want to instruct you a little bit not only on putting this necklace together but give you tips because what we learned today the tools and the techniques you can actually go out on your own 
and create and design and make a necklace as well. So as in anything else in life, of course, you know, you got to think of the basics, the foundations first. So I'm going to move my computer screen so you can see the setup I've made. So does that look good? Can you see the work table I have there? Excellent, excellent. Okay, so it's important to make yourself a workspace. So you can see I just took a, a cloth napkin here. And it's also very important that you pay attention to all the different components because beads especially they're very tricky and they can disappear <laughs> very easily and you know uh, in a necklace everything is measured out counted out so it's very important that we do not lose anything and it gets very frustrating if that happens so just be mindful and be patient etc 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 okay so on the handout we can see uh all of our ingredients so i've lined them up on the handout and on my work table you know, the order in which we're going to use them. So we have the blue thread, we have the silk for tassel, we have the focal oval component to make the tassel, we have our elastic that's going to hold the necklace that we string, a little focal bead, six color theme accent beads for the separate energy, and then the main white jade beads. Okay. FYI, so the, the, brace, the necklace has two sides that we do equally and we'll connect it at the end. So what I've done to make it easier is dis distributed the white beads for myself in two sets of 54 because 54 beads of the white beads will go on each side. Excellent. Feel free, like always in these classes, to interject and ask a question, uh, hopefully through the PDF instructions and me walking together with you through this that it would be clear. No, Donna, let me jump in for one second okay. and ask the question. Does every does everybody have the PDF um, that Donna is using? Does, did I, did, well, let me ask a better question. Did anybody unmute yourself or raise your hand or put it in the chat? Does anybody not have the PDF? Yep, I, I don't. Okay, you I don't, don't have, have it. Um, Adina Malka, I'm going to drop it. Okay, I'm going to drop it into the chat box. Um, and then, okay, so then all of you should have it. So Donna, continue. I'm going to, once again, mute myself. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to drop the file into the chat. Okay. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Um, during the, the class, if we have a question, do you prefer we do it in the chat window or unmute ourselves and talk? Unmute, please. Okay, thank you. All right. Shall Do we need the PDF? Donna? I'm sorry? We need the PDF. I don't have it either. Well, the rabbi is putting it in the chat. I have no clue how to do that. Okay, well, you can watch. It's not absolutely necessary. Right. Okay. Excellent. No worries. Okay, let's get started. Okay. So if you're, I'm, I'm going to be working as a right-hand person. So I'm taking the blue thread in my right hand and I want to make a small knot on the left side of the thread connecting it to the oval sphere. Hey, how are you doing? Okay, so try to make it as small as possible, the knot. So we're not making it halfway, we're just tying one end of the blue thread to one to end of the, po uh, the top or bottom circular <laughs> oval of the, of the uh, silver sphere. So I'm gonna do that. And you do it too, please, along together. Is it a single knot or a double yeah, knot? A single knot. On this one, it's a single. It doesn't have to be, you know, perfect, just so it's connected. We call it in jewelry making organic. So <laughs> it's not like the computer where everything has to be perfect. Okay, there you go. We did it. First step. Yay. Okay. 
voila. That's for Sandrine. <laughs> okay, everybody see that? Excellent. Okay, so we're, we started, we started making jewelry. Okay, now we're going to make, so that's the first step. The second step is we're gonna make the tassel. So while we do this, uh, you know, we can start talking about the Sephiroth energies if it, if it works. So I am working here on the ocean side, Kabbalah of character, which is yellow and green for connected and empathetic. And anyway, so from a jewelry point of view, this we're going to knot in the middle. So fold this in half and put that, once it's folded in a half, over the knot that you made with the blue cord. And make a, a knot with the silk. So say that again now you said fold it in half yes so the blue cord we didn't fold it in half we tied right, right we tied a knot at the oh, end you, of it oh so you're just saying fold it in half to get a center on it yes okay gotcha yes. so there we go so we have the tassel Um, a question came through just now. Is there spiritual significance to the way, um, sorry, to that way, or can fold and loop it through itself? Uh, no, I don't think there's a spiritual significance to the way that the actual uh, uh, items are tied. Is that is that correct, Donna? Correct. No spiritual significance to that, no. It's That's more of the aesthetic, right? Aesthetic and and functionality, yes. Aesthetic and functionality, yes. And that was just a single knot as well. Yes, because we're going to do a double knot at the end when we fit, but uh, with the with the with the elastic. But this is very light and easy. So yeah, so from an aesthetic point of view and a functionality, one knot, single knot, is is sufficient, and also from a design point of view, very nice, excellent. And Donna, this goes the silk knot goes over the knot of the blue thread. Is that yeah. right? Yes, it, do, it doesn't Thank have to, you know, again, organic, but that's the general idea, as long as they're in the vicinity of each other. Okay, so we made good progress so far. So now we're actually going to start constructing the necklace. So please take out your piece of stretch cord. It's very long. I always make it excess length. It's better to be too long than too short because we can always cut at the end the excess. So please fold that in half. And put that through the top of the silver sphere. So the exact opposite side of where you made the knots. You make, you make, um, what, what do you do with the, the clear? You put it through, you string it through the, the opposite side of the silver oval sphere. Do you tie a knot? Or no. You, you're just pulling it through? Yes. So once we do that, okay, this, the next step, I don't want to, I shouldn't say, I don't want to scare anyone, but this is perhaps the trickiest of the night, but again, it's not that tricky, so that's good news. Okay, so take the focal silver bead in your left hand and the two ends of the stretch cord in your right hand so that they're aligned. And put them together through one of the holes of that silver focal bead and push them all the way through. You're pushing two pieces of the cord through one hole? Yes. I mean, if necessary, you can do one at a time, either way. So 
Okay, and then once we do that, then we can pull the ends of the elastic all the way through. Oh, don't go too fast. <laughs> So then the silver bead should end up on top of the oval ring? Yes, exactly. Both, Thank you. Uh, both, ends, both ends go through at the same time? Yes, or you can do it one at a time if, if that works better for you. You're going through the same hole, right? Yes. And I once the, the things are, once the white cord is through, then what? Okay, so we, once you do that, I didn't do that. Ay, ay, ay. It's okay. Take your time. Okay. So at that point, we can see the beginnings of the necklace. So put your, put what you've done so far in front of you flat and take each side of the cord elastic cord and separate them. Separate each side completely. You know, pull it, just pull it gently so that they're not, it's not intermingled. So you can see the distinct sides. Okay, you've lost me. Spread mm -hmm. the two sides of the cord. So you have one half on one side of your working area and one side, and then the other piece on the other side of your working Correct. area. Correct, correct. So you can visualize how the, the necklace will be starting to form from the two sides. So right now, what we have is the tassel that we've made and it's hanging from the cord. And now we're going to start working to bead each side of the cord to make the necklace itself. Can you tell the significance again on the number of beads that we're going to be using? Yes. Yeah, so first, so that's a good, perfect timing because at this point, we're going to start using one of the six beads, which represent the separate energy. So Rabbi, if you could please talk about number six. Something's not right. Um, we lose the rabbi. It's okay. We can we can do it. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. Did I miss something? <laughs> yes, we were, asking about, <laughs> we were asking for your insights on the number six. Hold on one second. I need to explain something. I just got a call from somebody who got a call from someone who has not been able to jump on yet to get online. So I'm trying to help them get on. That's why I was distracted for a moment. That's important. Don't think I was. I was just Netflix. Uh, uh, you know. Yeah, you know, um, binging, you know, the latest, whatever it was, it was a work related conversation. So that's it. Full disclosure. Okay. So what was the question about which number? So we're just about to start beating and we start this necklace beating with one of the six, uh, Sephiroth color energy beads. So that brings us to the significance of why did I decide to use six accent beads? And that, you know, what's the meaning in Kabbalah of six? All right. So I'm like a Kabbalist in a candy store, which is not a thing, by the way. <laughs> but I'm, uh, that's a perfect, it's a great question. And I'm happy to, <laughs> to address the question. Okay. So six. First of all, here's what you need to know. Every number is the greatest number. Because whatever number you're talking about, whatever number is at hand is the greatest number. It's kind of like, you know, you ask a rabbi, um, which day is the most significant day? You know what the answer is going to be? Shabbos. Unmute yourself if you know what the answer is going to be. Shabbos. Today. That's right. Today is the most important day. Yes, we have Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Passover, Hanukkah, all these wonderful days. But today is the day that we have. So the number that we have is going to be the most significant. So six is the most incredible number. Other numbers, but six is amazing. But really, about the power of six, there are six emotive divine powers, six emotive energies, six sephiroth now there's 10 total sephiroth 10 total divine emanations um three are intellectual chachma bina and dat so the first three are intellectual um the last one is called malchut which is uh leadership so it's not really kind of an emotional quality it's more of a leadership quality you know kind of guiding others but six refers to 
the um, the emo- the emotional powers that we have. I actually, you know, now that we're speaking of these energies, um, can I take a moment and share my screen? Is that going to throw anybody off? Can I share my screen for a moment? Yes. Okay. I had enough people that uh, that indicated yes that I'm going to go ahead with it. Okay. So I have here a very crude chart. When I say crude, I mean it's a very basic uh, elementary chart of the Sephirot elements. Here are the 10 Sephirot. We have three intellectual, seven emotional, but like I told you before, really there's six core emotional energies. And the bottom one, Malchut leadership is, again, more how you know a, one person can extend toward another person and guide and lead and mentor, et cetera. So it's less of an emotional quality, uh, rather a functional quality. But just uh, to quickly focus on these energies. So three intellectual are wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. The six emotional, the six core emotional powers, which by the way are configured um, in the in this tree of life as as a as as right, left, and center. That's the way it works. Right, left, and center, and it forms two triangles. So we have Chesed, Gevura, Teferet, and Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. So right, left, center. Right, left, center. It's those two triangles um, that form the six core emotive energies. Chesed on the right side is loving kindness, generosity, giving, um, yeah, giving. On the left side is Gevura, which is severity, and that's withholding. So if you want to think about this uh, for a moment, it's kind of like a hand open or a hand closed. Open hand, Chesed, closed hand would be Gevura. In the middle is Teferet, which is compassion, or the way I wrote it here, typo is compassion, very uh, with the extended A's. But anyway, compassion is... Um, it's about judging a little bit with Gevura, but also extending the kindness of Chesed. So it's kind of that middle, um, the middle path. It's a harmony, it's a blend of Chesed and Gevura. Teferit also means beauty, because the, the concept of beauty is when you mix and match multiple elements together uh, to, to form a, uh, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, by the way, Don, I will say that the jewelry is beautiful that you created. Uh, and that everyone is creating. Um, and I will say that that within within the jewelry, I noticed that there is a Teferit-like system of balance. In other words, it's not just one thing. You know, even if you chose one color, like one color pattern, it's multiple colors with multiple elements that all work together in kind of a harmony and balance. So you have like a right side, a left side, and a middle, even within the necklace, necklace itself. And I think that that is, um, it's interesting. At least I found it interesting. Uh, that was the next. goal. Yes, that's part of the design principle. Yes, thank you yeah. for noticing. <laughs> right, left, and center. And there's a balance and a mixture of yes. different elements and colors and materials. And and everything yeah. really also leads. Like the, the tassel, even though it's like, I guess, when you're looking face on to the completed piece, it looks like it's on the end of the bottom. But as we can see making it, we're building it out from there. So it grows together. Right, right. And just to finish off the, the, the last three of the emotional energies, we have Netzach, Hod, and Yisod. Netzach is ambition. Hod is devotion or humility. It's kind of um, surrender. And then Yisod is bonding, communication. So the way it works in Kabbalah is people have, all of us have all of these energies. And we have a unique blend of all these energies. But typically people are either lean a little bit more to the right. This is not a political, <laughs> this is not political right or left. This is people either lead, lean toward the, this chart, the spirit chart to the right, to the left, or toward the center. So people are either more outgoing, gregarious, uh, generous, that's the right side, more disciplinarian, withholding, surrender, that's the left side, or more connective, compassion, uh, communication, bonding, and that's the middle path. And those are the three, uh, kind of the three energies that we captured with the different colors. The blue purple was the right side. Um, the I think it was the red. Don sunrise, sunrise, red, orange. Red, orange, right? Yeah, sunrise was on the left side, and the the green, uh, yellow, yellow green was was uh, was the middle. And okay. the colors have significance in Kabbalah, but it's really about the energies. It's really about understanding the the modality of the right side, which is the giving, which is the outgoing, the left side, which is the withholding, and then the middle path, which is about connection. So that's a very quick overview. We can we can delve into it a little bit more, but that's some some of the significance of six. You know what's exciting? During your talk, I saw that my fellow jewelers 
are starting to bead the necklace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you get back to it. Okay. I just wanted to ask Ray, did you, is it, are you, are you making that way there? I'm not okay at all. I did something wrong already. Uh-oh. What did I do wrong? What is this oh. silver thing? It looks good. The tassel looks good, right? So put the put the um the what plastic cord, the elastic cord. Yeah. Do you have the two pieces together? I have it together and I have the silver bead on it, right? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Like this? And then, uh yes. Yes. I, okay. I, I So then no. you're okay. You're on track. <laughs> And we start putting the beads on. Yeah. Okay, so what? now, okay, so now what we're gonna do again, okay. once remember, we um, we you can see my table, okay, good. Okay, so start with the red, the do one side at a time, please. Start whichever side you feel most comfortable with, um, and start with one of your sephirot beads, the colored beads. By the way, can I jump in? I'm so sure. sorry. I just want to jump in. According to Kabbalah, we always, if, if given a choice, we always start on the right side. Okay, good. So in general, if you if you have the choice, always start on the right side. This is not a jewelry advice, but it's <laughs> it's a um, it's a Kabbalah advice. There's a question coming in the chat, Donna. How many white beads on each side? Okay, so it's also it's in the PDF. There are going to be 54 total white beads on each side, but it's in sets of 18. So each set of 18 is separated by one of the color beads. So, so you start on the right side, take the right stretch cord in your right and whatever hand is comfortable for you and then string a color bead, one color bead. Okay, this is not happening. And then string 18 white beads. Oh, that's so, funny. So why do we start on the right side, Rabbi? We start on the right side because we we always and Kabbalah is is very strong about um, advising us to put out the energy that we want from God and from the universe. So primarily, although we have all of these wonderful blends of different energies and emotional energies and personality and character energies. The reality is that I think most most of us would like abundant blessings that flow our way without too much impediment. In other words, but what, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's nachas and joy from the family, from our parents, from our children, from our friends, whatever it is, we want abundance. We want things to flow and flow freely and not be held back. And so that's a right side energy. The right side energy is a free flowing, giving, generous energy. And so we always lean toward um, starting with the right, even if we're primarily ourselves more of a left-sided uh, individual, because we're more, you know, disciplinarian and more, you know, rule uh, giver and followers. Nonetheless, we always uh, try to uh, to to lead with the right, despite our our own personal character. By the way, this is why, according to Judaism, and this is in the Code of Jewish Law, when we get dressed. Uh, the custom is that we always put the right side of the garment on first before the left side. So if it's a shirt, um, pants, whatever it is, always the right side, then the left side. Shoes also, is, socks and shoes, same thing. Nice. Is there is there anything behind um, the expression that the left is sinister? No. no I mean, okay. not in Kabbalah. Okay. I haven't heard that. Yeah. I, I can tell you where that comes from if you want. Okay. Um, sinister is left because when the knights would have their would dueling and they would could um, if you're shaking with your right hand you can't pull your sword but if you're shaking with your left hand if you're shaking with your right hand and you're left-handed you can pull your sword with your left hand and sinister means left so the word sinister came to mean um, like evil because you could you could shake with your right hand and kill with your left with the sword. So you were, it was like being tricky. Yeah. It's also that in Latin, sinister means left. Nice. So is, there, is everybody beating? So we did started on the right side of the cord. We started with one color bead and then 18 white beads. 
and then another color bead, and then 18 white beads. Is is everyone on track with that? Oh, no. I've only got like six on. You can take your time as long as you got the principle down. So yeah. Rabbi, could you explain the significance of 18, the 18 white sets, the sets of 18 white beads, please? Oh, you can, of course, if you thought six was great. Oh, That's about high. It. Are you kidding me, 18? Oh, chai, chai you doing? So 18 is chai. I mean, we all know chai, chai is life. Um, Chai is the new, so the numerology. So every Hebrew letter uh, has a numerology, it's connected with the number. So the numerology, the Hebrew letters that correspond to 18 are the letters uh, Chet and the letter Yud, which spell the word Chai, which means life. So whenever somebody wants to evoke the notion of life, um, whether it's, you know, the idea of a blessing for life and for health, or giving, you know, uh, perhaps a contribution, a gift, a donation. So we try to do it in multiples of 18, and, and the 18 is a significant, uh, significant number. By the way, it doesn't have to be 18, but it, there's a tradition sometimes to do it in 18 just to evoke this idea of life. But essentially, chai, 18, 18 is significant because of the association with the word chai, which means life. So multiples of chai is a nice gift. 10 yes. times chai, yes. yes. <laughs> Any, any multiple. <laughs> right, exactly. Any, but look, the, the bigger the better, obviously. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, uh, reflecting back to the days of the bar and bat mitzvah circuit my kids were on, and we had to have gifts for every single one. So chai was a good rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me give another jeweler's tip here. Um, as you can see, we're doing a lot of work by stringing all these beads. So the last thing you want, let's say you're almost done with stringing the right side and all of a sudden to lose all the beads, they all come off. So that wouldn't be fun. So this happens a lot in making jewelry. So once again, pay attention to your space, you know, try to keep things flat. That helps uh, prevent mishaps. And you can also double count to make sure that it's really 18 white beads. So you don't put one, two, one less or one more, so you'd have to rebead. So these are little jeweler's tricks. <laughs> Is everyone making headway on beads? Very slowly. Okay, that's okay. I took 18 beads out of the bag, left the rest in. Yeah, so that's part of it, preparation, right. You know, that's another trick. So the next, you know, a next project, it would be good. It would make things easier to to count out the beads separate, you know, yep. the sets. Yes, that is a core part and an efficiency step. Did you say that these are glass beads? No, they're real jade. It's white oh. jade. Everything I work with is authentic and real, yes. As I mentioned to, to the rabbi, I showed him some pictures. Yes, so um, I have my jewelry. These, this is my signature item. Uh, a 108 bead necklace. Uh, of course, each design is different, but the style, the, the concept. So I have these actually in Lulu Boutique at Pond City Market. Um, I have them at a store at Lenox Mall and they sell up to, the retail price is $78. So of course, I only use authentic real gemstones and that's what gives you the real gemstone energy and the quality and the joy. And then the tassel is real silk, sorry, Indian recycled. The blue cord is real hemp. The focal bead is real pewter. So everything is very high quality. It's what you call a statement necklace. <laughs> so what's By the way, can, Donna, can I point out? Sure. You talk about the retail price. I'm gonna say the Jewish thing. Uh -huh. What a deal tonight, folks. <laughs> what a deal, are you kidding me? You kidding? You get an experience. You get a a a a, a, a boutique craft piece with yeah. the experience. Come on, this is fantastic. Yeah. And so, the, Rabbi, are you making one too as we do this? You know what? I have to admit, I'm not. But I really want to, and I have the I have the PDF, and so after this, I'm going to rewatch it and uh, and create one. Rivka would really like one of these, Rabbi. I think you should I know. keep going. I know, I know. It's a little big like for her, but I think we can. 
Never mind, you just had a birthday in your household. Yes, 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 yes. So the colored beads, the accent beads are agate. Those are authentic gemstones that, as well. Those are agate. Uh, of course, different colors according to your sephirot. Image. What are the qualities of agate and jade? So the white, the jade, the, the white jade, the quality is that it's white. The whiteness of the stone is what is what gives it the uh, prosperity. It's known for prosperity and good luck. You know, like Hatikva, you know, like the Israeli flag is white, you know, white is pure. And so I'm sure, I'm sure the significance of white in Kabbalah, Rabbi? Yeah, yeah, no, white, white is about the purity. That's why, on, for example, on Yom Kippur, the custom is to wear white garments, which evokes the idea of purity and kind of a rebirth, uh, brand Fencing. new energy, clean slate. That's kind of what white evokes. Mm -hmm. The, the white is the jade? Yes, 108 beads. I want it, that's right. So the, so the concept of having the, so anyway, just let me, before I continue, I completed my right side. Is everyone else pretty much making his oh, way? Almost. Okay, good. No, not me. Okay, I, it's I okay. I have a hard time find, finding the hole once I pick it. Okay, I know, you, need, you know what yeah. helps is a lot of light and, and reading glasses. <laughs> that is one of the hard I know that's, or turn, that's turn the clock back a few years right exactly <laughs> okay so I'm starting on my left side and again one of the tricks is make sure you keep the right side you've already completed you know away from working on the left side so you don't want any mishaps okay um, on the right side when you finish it off you should have three sets of white and three of the colored beads is that right yes so the initial stone, when you start beading on each side, right off of the of the pewter focal bead, is the is is one colored bead, is one sephirot bead, one accent bead, and then you do, and then you do start eighteen white. So is so, this a is this a traditional necklace to make, or is this something that you came up with through your studies? Okay, so. I got into gemstone jewelry through my yoga. I became, I got into yoga <laughs> and became certified in yoga. And in yoga, there we do we'll use a, wear a lot of gemstone jewelry, um, like beaded bracelets, and a core, a core principle, a core adornment of yo of yogis is is a mala necklace, and which is uh, is 108 beads. 108 beads has a lot of significant, 108 has a lot of significance in a lot of cultures, in, include, and in the yoga philosophy. And um, so that the, re the necklace, the 108 beads was helpful in meditation for yoga. Like if you're sitting and it helps you keep focused by counting slowly, like a bead after a bead. So you're centered on that. So are you saying we're doing a catechism? Well, no, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> I mean, no, just to, just to between, between us, what did attract me to yoga is to me, I viewed it as a secular spirituality. So that's how, that's how it resonated with me. Um, so, you know, I don't, I know some people feel that some, some parts of yoga, historically yoga has some religious, uh, aspects but for me personally i i viewed it as um as a kind of a ecumenical spirituality so i take it from it kind of like the discussion we had today at the parsha session was about mindfulness and positivity and gratitude so all those things is what yoga and meditation talks about so like that's so you could use a mala necklace to help you in in centering around um, you know gratitude and mindfulness and positivity. So uh, but so yes yeah, so this this design but so I took that theme that concept and I modernized it and fashionized it and um, 
and I work with a lot of different cultures. So I can make a necklace like this, like using African trade beads and bring the heritage of Africa to life. So, um, so that's, that's the explanation. So it is my signature design and I enjoy, everyone is one of a kind and that this is an original design I did for us and from my inspiration from the Daily Power Parsha. And I enjoy, you know, creating something that infuses a spirituality and mm. culture and things like that what and that brings you happiness. What you Anna, what, I'm sorry? What did you say the, um, the tassel was made from? So the components of the tassel, the colorful, uh, it's silk, it's recycled sari silk. So actually from real Indian saris, you know, like when they make the saris and then, you know, remnants fall and things like that. So they gather up the remnants and they make it into a ribbon. So this is authentic recycled Indian sari silk. And the blue cord is hemp, natural hemp. Yeah, I'm always also looking, sourcing for very good natural, natural, authentic, uh, you know, sustainable materials. I still haven't got my first. It's it's okay. Just take your time and you know patience and just, you know it's not a it's not a race. <laughs> Excuse me. Out of, cur out of curiosity, um, who amongst us is has made jewelry before or is a jewelry maker? I, I have made jewelry. Wow, nice. I did a painting of a necklace. Mm -hmm. I make jewelry. I do nice. too. This is a first for me and I love it. Thank you. I think when I was little, we used to make uh, beaded necklaces and things when I was real small. What? Excuse me? No, when I was when I was a child, we made beaded necklaces. Mm -hmm. It's all the way up. Rabbi, do you want to uh, talk about the significance of one of beads? One uh, Yes, 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 yes. So uh, one hundred eight is actually very interesting. <laughs> I can hear um, one hundred eight. What did we find in numerology? Oh, oh. yeah. So it, was, it was wild. You know, I was looking at, we, we were thinking about 108 and the significance yeah. and, and Donna mentioned that it has significance in other traditions. And by the way, I just want to comment on, on that. Um, you mentioned yoga and spirituality. Um, we did a program a few years ago called Kabbalah Yoga, which combined Kabbalah and yoga. And we had, very interesting, we were making the poses. Um, oh, hold on. Caroline is asking a question before I continue. Should we tie off the side with a knot? Okay, you're getting ahead of us. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get there. <laughs> right. Okay, so the answer is not yet. Not yet. Not yet. That's a rabbi joke. Not yet. K N O T. <laughs> not yet. Okay, good. Oh, no. So so then I'll, I'll continue just briefly talking about the number 108. But again, spirituality, there's so many yeah, different yeah, spiritual traditions. Do you want to start and, on and I think the beautiful yeah, thing is when you, have, um, when you have similar themes in multiple traditions, it just reinforces the power of that theme. Maimonides says that when a, when a concept, when a piece of wisdom comes up in multiple philosophies, religions, traditions, that only further affirms the validity of that concept and that fact that it's manifest in so many different places just uh, kind of supports the authenticity of it. Anyway, I mentioned that because 108 is significant, not only in, in other cultures, but also in Judaism. One of the interesting um, numerologies of 108 is that it corresponds to the Hebrew letters that spell the word ha'avanim, which in Hebrew means the stones, the stones, like the, not like the rolling stones, not those stones, but like the stones um, Ha'avanim, the numerology is 108. And I thought that is, I mean, you can't make that up. So that's kind of cool. I probably should make the connection because we're working with stones, gemstones. So, Just so what, yes. So what was the, can you, 
what happened with the Kabbalah and yoga? What, so how did that work? Kabbalah and yoga, yeah. So we had a fellow from Montreal who came down. He spoke about the concept. Um, and then he did a class. Interestingly enough, the, the Chabad, Chabad in town, we recently moved, and in town Jewish Academy, about a year and a half ago, moved into a building right on the Beltline, around the corner from Pond City Market. And it used to be Urban Body Studios. Well, when it was still Urban Body Studios, and when we were up the street on Ponce de Leon Avenue, so I called Urban Body Studios, and we rented out one of their studios and one of their um, workout spaces, and we did a yoga session, a Kabbalah yoga session, and essentially, it was made, the poses were mirroring the Hebrew letters, the shape of the Hebrew letters. Oh, Rabbi, I was at that chorus. Oh, you were there, yeah. That was a while ago. It was a little while back. I still have the handout. Yeah, the chart with the letters. Yeah, how to make each letter pose. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So what about the insights on the Kabbalah of character, the Sephirot energies? The colors? Yes, yes. Let's talk about that while everyone is still stringing the beads. So like I mentioned before, Kabbalah attempts to kind of crack the code of human behavior, not necessarily to explain all of the, you know, subconscious stuff that's going on within, within each of us, although it does talk about that, but, but essentially to explain the, the fact that we each have different character traits and some of us lean toward one side or the other, but at the core, we have all of the, all of the abilities. So to give you an example, um, imagine two parents uh, father and a mother, let's say, and each one takes a different approach to discipline or to their children. So one parent might say, oh, let the children play outside or whatever it is. They're going to get dirty, muddy. It doesn't make a difference. Let them have fun. Kids need to have fun. And the other parent will say, no, they need to, you know, not play in the mud and not get dirty and have take care of the clothes and, you know, be more of the rule giver. They're different people have different personalities. Kabbalah teaches that they're all valid assuming they're healthy, but they're all valid. You could have, we could lean toward chesed and be more generous or more giving or more um, uh, tolerant, if you will. Gvura would be a little bit stricter and harsher and both are good. You need to give and you also need to sometimes know when not to give. So for example, when it comes to a child, so you have a very generous person wants to give, but what if the child, the little child asks for a sharp knife so you would hope that even if you're very generous, you, you would hope that what's the answer? The answer is no. That ability to say no is coming from Gevura, from that severity, from that restraint. And so Kabbalah teaches that ultimately, you know, the different characteristics, each of them really needs the other. So you really do need a blend. But, but each of us has our own personality. When we come into the world, our souls come down through the worlds. And as it tumbles through the worlds, it takes on certain uh, strengths and certain weaknesses. And the goal is to work with our strengths and to push against our weaknesses. But we, we were certainly meant to, to use our strengths. And so part of uh, what I think is great and unique about this, this uh, tonight's workshop is that you were all able to choose your, not only your favorite color, but also hopefully you, you took a look at what they correspond to. So we have, um, we had the, the right side, the twilight color, the blue and purple, which was creative and outgoing. So creativity is a mark of Chachma and outgoing is a mark of, of Chesed. These are all right side attributes, creative and outgoing. The left side is, and you might, that, that might uh, resonate with you. Maybe you chose that color, that, that, that style because you like the color, but maybe you chose it based on personality. The left side is the sunrise, which is red and orange, and that's contemplative and disciplined. So it's a thinker, somebody who's thinking, calculated, disciplined, organized. That's the left side. And again, they're not mutually exclusive and everyone needs both and we all have both. But typically people lean toward one or the other. Either they're more creative and outgoing, you know, party, whatever, or contemplative and disciplined. The middle path would be the connected and empathetic, which is thinking about kind of a depth, a deeper connection connecting with others, connecting with ideas. And, uh, and of course, the idea of empathy, which is very important, which is connecting with the way another person is. So not just giving, not just not giving, 
but really connect and feeling how somebody else feels. And we all need all of these powers and we all have all of these soul powers, but we typically have strengths in, in, in one of these three areas. To give you kind of an example, so the Kabbalists say that the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, correspond exactly to these three modalities. Abraham is the right side, he's the giver, he's outgoing, he's creative, right? He creates a pop-up tent to teach people about monotheism. He feeds them and says, hey, don't forget to bless God. He's very creative and outgoing. Isaac is the well digger. Isaac is all about digging the well. Digging the well is very introspective. It's digging within. It's understanding that the water is within and we're just uncovering the inside. So it's very, it's, 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 it's digging inside, it's inner work. So that's the left side, contemplative and, uh, and, and disciplined. And then you have the middle path, which is Jacob. Jacob is the middle path. He's connected, he's empathetic. He lives a very colorful life. And, uh, and he's, he's that middle path that ultimately, ultimately is the, uh, the father of the Jewish people. We are B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. Of course, Israel is a euphemism, is another name for, for Jacob. And, uh, and that becomes the, the middle pillar. So we need all three. And I just noticed, I think in the chat, let me go back to the chat. It looks like, um, yeah, so we could either in life, we could either, and, and it's not either or, but sometimes we work on emphasizing our strengths and sometimes we work on kind of uh, working with the areas that need to be strengthened. So we can either play up what we already are strong in, or we can work on kind of getting stronger in the areas that maybe we feel a little bit of a weakness in. So we find ourselves very generous but not great with the rules or not great with self-discipline. So we need to lean a little toward the left. If we feel ourselves, you know, leaning toward the left and being very disciplinarian, but not as maybe loving or demonstratively loving as we, as we'd like to be, we need to lean a little bit to the right. And everyone needs to lean toward the, toward the middle to have that connection and empathy, especially today where um, it's easy to, to become polarized. We need to have uh, that empathy and that connection with each other. And, and I, I also, I, I need to mention this, um, the, the, the menorah, which is a classic Jewish symbol, the candelabra. So the menorah had, in the temple times, it had seven branches. Our Chanukiyot, the Hanukkah menorahs that we have, have eight plus a middle one, have nine branches. But the temple menorah had seven. Three on one side, three on the other side, and one in the middle. And the Kabbalists explain that the six sorry, the seven branches of the menorah correspond to the, the six plus one, the seven emotive energies, including Malchut, the last one that I mentioned was leadership. And the overarching message for us is that no matter where you fall on this candelabra of life, no matter which personality you have, whether it's right, left, center, or any shade of the above, the reality is that we all share a common purpose. We're all here to bring light, like the menorah, like all the branches of the menorah. If it was on the right side, the left side, they were all about being lit and bringing light into the world. And so we ha we should look at ourselves that way. You know, we might be, yeah. Nice, oh yeah, that's uh, that's an original, <laughs> well, not the original, but yeah, yeah, that's a temple, that's a depiction, Adina Malka, Adele Northrup. If you look at her screen, if you have the Brady Bunch view, so you could see Adele's, um, Adina Malka's uh, picture or uh, menorah over there. So yeah, whether you're on the right side, whether you're on the left side, so it's all about bringing light. Okay, is, um, a is question there six, came in from it, Leslie. Oh, Two sorry. white extra jade beads. Okay, so that was, you know, I guess it's like a baker's dozen. It was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, uh, after I astutely counted out 108 beads for everybody, I put in a few extra just in case. And, you know, oh, there's an expression that Sandrine can tell you in French. It's okau. Oh, just in case, okay, so those can be two lucky white beads. You can decide what to do with them. I wanted to add to what the rabbi was saying about the different energies. So gemstones can be used to, to reinforce uh, on a given day uh, the kind of energy you're looking for. So let's say you have a big presentation to do uh, and you, you know you want some, some more, you know, some inner, moral support. So
So you could like wear a bracelet, a hematite bracelet, which is a gemstone, which signifies and inspires strength and force and, uh, you know, intensity. Or let's say you uh, were going to visit a friend that uh, maybe wasn't feeling well, then maybe you would wear a necklace like a rose quartz, which is a gemstone that has empathy and, and compassion and things like that. So, you know, we can use gemstones to help us uh, try to uh, have within us uh, those energies that we want to exude. And um, by wearing them as jewelry, that has it, you know, closest to our heart and our skin and things like that. So that's a good way to use the, the gemstone energy. Excellent. So I think we've all made good headway on this necklace, I have a feeling. So let me bring back to my table. So I think you all really are at the same stage now. So you see the way I'm holding the two sides. You hold the left side in your left hand, the right side in your right hand. And again, be careful so that you don't want to lose anything at this point. So I have to rebead. So to tie the knot, carefully hold up in front of you the two sides and let all the beads gently fall all the way down so that there's no excess uh, visible uh, stretch cord. I mean, you don't have to pull or anything, but just let it hang naturally. Okay, so once you have that, again, be careful. And at this point, we're gonna make a double knot. You can even do a triple knot. Okay, but gently and carefully and slowly, uh, make the knot, pull gently, don't force or too quick. So, cause you want a nice, clean, easy knot. So it seems like there's not, so you don't leave a lot of space. So it's a natural connection. Okay, I want you to do the first knot. Same thing with the second knot. Okay, is everyone okay with where we are right now? I'm just I'm watching, I'm not that far along. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay. I'm just, my last few beads. No worries. Um, now when you say, um, tie it like just um, a square knot kind of thing? Um, just a basic knot, just a standard knot. I got confused here. <laughs> Where does white jade come from? White jade, you know, most most beads come from various places. I believe that this, I believe our beads are from the United States. But sometimes, you know, even though st uh, stones might be mined in one country, they might, the, uh, the raw excess, like big chunks might be exported to another country for the cutting and making it into beads. Okay. What is the significance of white jade again? Hope, prosperity, purity. And also, you know, once again, you know, bring this, the Jewish kind of feel with the Israeli flag and the talus. And also for, for our design where we wanted to showcase different Sephiroth energies and their colors, of course, the universal white is a nice foundational bead. I think there's a beautiful meditation there that I'd like to, I mean, you know, like a thought that exactly on your point, Donna, that you just said, imagine the soul, the pure soul as kind of like that pure white light. And then the individual person, and we all share that we all have the same pure divine energy within us. 
And on top of that, we each bring our own unique color and flavor. Our, each of our souls has a unique you know, blend of the different energies. We lean a little this way, a little that way. We have a very unique combination. Um, think about it if you've ever um, you know, used the program like Photoshop or something, or, or any program in which you're kind of on the computer using, um, choosing colors or manipulating colors, you know that every color has, in certain programs, has a number. And if you tweak, you, know, you just bump something up a little bit, you get a different shade and a brand new color. So think of, of each of our souls as like have, having a unique blend that no other soul has, but underlying it all is that pure, that pure divine spark, that pure godly energy. And on that level, we're all the same, we're all equal. So it's, I think it's very apropos, Donna, that um, all the necklaces have the same core base, the same core you know, 108 white beads. And on top of that, we have the different styles, different colors. Um, it, would this be a gift fit for anyone? Yes. I mean, it, I, I, I make men's jewelry and unisex jewelry, but I feel this design even though now, you know, you know, every, everything goes, whatever people feel comfortable with, but I feel this is more a woman's design. But I do make these kind of necklaces for men, you know, with men in mind, like it would be hematite dark beads or tiger eye beads and maybe a leather tassel. Hey, so Donna, tying off this uh, type of string, this elastic -y, nylon, whatever, um, it doesn't seem to want to stay in place. Okay, so do a couple. You can. I I just did actually like five, <laughs> and just pull it, you know, and then you can put a small dab of glue. Um, yeah, you can put a small dab of glue, any really type of glue. Yeah, because it just seems like it wants to slide open. Um, so you know, so you get the gist. I mean, you know, you can try it again or later stuff but i know mine today for some reason was also that way but i just kept on making knots where's the blue cord go i'm sorry the blue that we started with where does that go that stays on the tassel do we do anything with the length of those pieces of fabric at the bottom no no i mean if you want you could tie knots at the end of the silk that's optional but like I said, you know, there's an organic uh, trend, too, in jewelry, you know, like, like kind of like you would have an unfinished hem or something, which is a, is a fashion trend. So since we're working with gemstones and spirituality, either way, either way is nice. And what is the name of the green stone again, the green bead? So each of, all of the colored beads are agate, and yeah. agate is actually dyed so it's the same stone but they do you know each color is different because it's a dyed stone it's a real stone but it's it's dyed so that makes the different colors oh the green one is agate agate yes and does that have a significance like you said the jade is old um agate is actually a very universal kind of workaround stone it's just it, it's mostly the colors like i said on the agate because it's dyed so, so, so it, so colors do emanate different energies. So, so you had, so like, so I made the ocean side, the ocean side Kabbalah character, which is yellow and green, connected and empathetic. And then you can also think the ocean side and the different soothing colors of the silk, you know, it kind of can, can inspire you to think of a rolling ocean and waves and the serenity of a beach and the calming and things like that. So, you know, gemstones, you do have to put your, you do have, it's kind of like spirituality. You have to have faith and, and also insert yourself. So, you know, you can use the gemstones for how you want to, to, to feel and be and use them and the colors as tools to help you focus and achieve that. You notice a difference for yourself, like when you wear these? Yes, I feel more grounded. I mean, and it's, you know, of course it's different because I, I made it, so. <laughs> so I feel like it's a part of me and very proud. I mean, like, yeah, so I'm going to make, I'm gonna have one of each of these, of these necklaces in each color, 
So yes, so not only will I use them, you know, to coordinate with my outfits, but also, yes, once again, like Oceanside, which I made today, I think, you know, that would be something nice for the weekend, you know, go out to brunch on Sunday or something like that to put you in a nice, you know, peaceful kind of pastoral sense. Yes, I feel if, you know, you, you meet the gemstones halfway, they can uh, help you achieve your, um, you know, what you desire. And initially I was just working with, with rough stones and, you know, like you can meditate with rough stones in your house, but I feel actually wearing the gemstones and especially with personal adornments. Now, these are all, of course, for all of you now to wear this, it's something personal that you made. So it's going to have a lot of meaning and it's going to give you a lot of inspiration and power and serenity. So once you start in that, you know, and you feel it and you experience it, I think you're going to become, you know, fascinated and eventually like addicted in a good way. <laughs> you know, I've never done yoga. I've heard that there are many different kinds. Which kind do you teach? I do a uh, basic vinyasa, which is the core poses. And also I teach from an inspirational point of view using gemstones and things. So a lot of meditation and a lot of foundational poses like, like the tree pose or the mountain pose, which are standing poses, which I teach, which anyone can do. And they're real yoga poses. And you don't even have to have a yoga outfit on or a yoga mat. And there are ways to become grounded at any time of the day. It's something you can just, you know, like we say, sometimes we can breathe, take a moment and breathe. You can take, you know, to kind of recenter from all the hectic things going around. So the same thing with some of the foundational poses in vinyasa, like um, the mountain pose and the tree pose, which can give a lot of strength and inner energy. So I, I teach a yoga for everybody, very uh, gentle, but, but solid and inspirational. And where is your studio? So I offer on site to businesses. And so I had a trunk show at Macy's actually March 7th, you know, like on the eve of the lockdown, I had a trunk show for my jewelry at Macy's Lenox Square. And it's also at the same time, I presented a yoga class for uh, clients and customers there actually in the store. So I do also, you know, like at residential buildings and things like that. So theme and custom and on site. So maybe you could do one for us. That would be amazing. Yes, mm -hmm. since I didn't realize we already have the history, we have to, that's right, bring it, bring it back. And then what would be really neat, then we all could be wearing our necklaces. Our, our right, necklaces. right. <laughs> Donna, so, can, can you show me on your necklace where the blue cord is? Yes, it is on the bottom of the tassel. On the bottom oh. of Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anything else we're supposed to do with the oh. tassel now? Um, no, not with the tassel. We do need to trim the excess of the stretch cord. And how close do you make it? Better. It's better to err on the side of safety. Once again, so this is, you can view the knot as a closure, you know, so it's the back of your neck. So no one's going to see it. So I would recommend, you know, not going too close to the knot. So leave about three quarters of an inch tail? Yes, More. on each side, yes, perfect. More? No, that's perfect. Okay. So I just completed the 18, 18, 18. Yup, see and that's already meditative. You're going 18, 18. Oh. So do I put like, uh, I guess I'd say, so now I have to start the other side. What? And I'll start the other side of property. Can you hang out till around midnight or? <laughs> oh, I'll be up for the week. <laughs> okay, so I'm modeling my, my necklace. Nice, look at that. Yay. Let me see, let me see. Well, well. 
Very nice. Nice. I don't know if you can see it. I keep getting oh, glare. I can't. Oh, it looks good on your dress. Yeah. So By the way, can, Adrian, can I mention can I mention something very special? So Adrian, sure. who's with us right now, has a beautiful art gallery at Chabad in town right now as we speak. Yeah, and um, Donna, you came. I did, yeah. I met you. I'm yeah. wearing the necklace that you were wearing. That's right. <laughs> I was the first attendee of the whole series. I was That's there great. at three o'clock when it opened. <laughs> That was perfect. Yes, yes, yes. The, uh, the art gallery is by appointment only because it's done obviously in a way that's, uh, you know, uh, of COVID. Uh, attentive to all of the safeguards of health. Uh, so just the call up Chabad if you want to check out. The, it's a beautiful gallery. Just give me up for a little bit. You can set an appointment to come by and check out the art. It's really gorgeous. Thank okay. you, Rabbi. Thank you. It's, it's really beautiful. Adele, you keep wanting to say something? Oh, well, I just, you know, you just called Rabbi Ari to, to get, make an appointment to see your artwork. Um, you can call um, just the Chabad in general. Um, whoever answers, usually it's Lauren or one of the rabbis, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just call the main number and uh, yeah. we'll get you to the gallery hotline. Yeah. And if you want to bring family or friends, remember we're doing social distancing and masks are mandatory. Um, um, but if there's uh, several of you coming down, then if I'm available, I could come down and meet you there as well. Oh, well, we ought to get a group together then. That sounds great. So do you take our temperature at the door? Yes. <laughs> No, but there is sanitizer and masks if you forget yours. <laughs> By the way, I wanted to mention, uh, so Donna, I mean, you mentioned about the trunk show at Macy's, and I would say, I mean, uh, you know, lots of things have happened because of coronavirus, but one of the things is you went from Macy's to in town Jewish Academy, which is, you know, just further up the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the ladder. <laughs> but really, Donna, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sincerely for collaborating together with me on this and for presenting this really fun at workshop. Um, and as we speak right now, I have word, my intel tells me that uh, my son Nassen and, uh, and Riva, my daughter Rivka, are actually making a necklace as we speak. So I believe that I'll, when I come home, I'll see a necklace <laughs> there made as well. Um, yeah. So I want to thank you on, 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 on every single level. Um, I'm looking around very quickly here. Um, yeah, I want to thank all of you for being on with us. Donna, sorry, go ahead. Other, just, other Donna, yeah. Other Do <laughs> Donna, um, I just want to say that this was a lot of fun and so relaxing. It was great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. yeah, you know, I really did take advantage of the meditative aspect of doing this. It was a lot of focus, and I was able to get rid of all the clutter from life around us these days. Yeah, nice. Yes. So, yes. It's Merci. a great idea. Merci, Jolie. Merci. <laughs> and thank you all for, for supporting this class and me and being my Torah study partners all these weeks and months. And uh, these will be a souvenir of uh, a living souvenir and memento for all of us, for all yeah. of us.